Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achano and welcome back to my OpenGL series. So last time we talked all about shaders and we basically just went through what shaders are and how they work. Definitely check out that video if you haven't already. There's a link up there. You're gonna need to know how shaders work because today we're going to write some shaders. And I'm actually really happy that we dedicated last video to just talking about what shaders actually are so that I don't have to do much talking today and I can actually write some code. So we're gonna just jump in and we're gonna start writing some code. If you don't have all of the code that we've written up to this point yet, you can either go through all of the videos in the playlist and just make sure you've got everything up to date or you can actually go to patreon.com forward slash the churno, help support the series and get access to all of the code episode by episode up to this point and going on into the future as well. Let's dive in and write some shader code. So just to quickly go through all the code that we've kind of got so far, or at least the important parts, after we kind of initialize OpenGL and all that, we're basically creating a vertex buffer, which is consistent of these vertex positions. Positions are the only attributes that we're currently specifying. We then specify the layout of that buffer, as well as kind of bind these attributes to a certain index, index number zero in this case, via a vertex attribute pointer. And then inside our render loop, we basically just clear the screen, draw the currently bound buffer, which is this one over here. And then we just swap the buffers and that's it. We don't bother unbinding anything or anything like that. We don't really need to. All we're doing is we're clearing and we're drawing this triangle. Now let's go ahead and actually write a shader. So the first thing we actually need to do, and this is a little bit tedious, which is why I kind of want to run through this as quickly as possible. But basically we're going to define a new function here, which is basically, it's going to be static because I don't want it to leak into other translation units or C++ files. It's going to return an integer and it's going to be called create shader. And we're actually going to take in two strings, const std string vertex shader and const std string fragment shader. And inside here, we're going to write the code necessary to compile these two shaders. Now, in this case, all we're doing is we're taking in the actual source code of the shaders as these actual strings. So we're providing two shaders, a vertex shader and a fragment shader. These strings are just meant to be the actual source code. Now shaders can come from a variety of different places. We could just, we could literally just write a string in our actual C++ application, which contains our shader, which is what we're going to do today, just for simplicity's sake. But you can also read them in from a file. You can download them from the internet. You can read them in as kind of binary data. There's a lot of different ways that you can actually kind of compile shaders and get to the shader compilation stage. In this case, we're going to provide OpenGL with a string. At the end of the day, you still need to provide OpenGL with a string, which is your shader source code. Usually, like you might wanna be taking that in from a file or something like that. But for now, we're just gonna be take, we're just gonna be reading them in as strings and we're going to write them in our C++ application. I think next episode, we're actually gonna take a look at how I like to deal with shaders in a more professional application. And we'll kind of write some code to basically simplify the further shaders that we're going to write in this series. But for now, we're just focusing on how to actually create shaders. So basically the purpose of this function is to do, well, a couple of things, but fundamentally, we need to provide OpenGL with our actual shader source code, our shader text, and we want OpenGL to compile that program, link these two together into a single shader program, and then give us some kind of unique identifier for that shader back so that we can actually bind that shader and use it. Same as like we did with our vertex buffer where we actually generate a buffer and we get an ID back and then whenever we want to bind it, we can just bind that buffer ID. So if we scroll back over here, let's start writing that code. So the first thing we need to do is create a shader program. Now here we kind of generated buffers. That's basically the equivalent here. We basically just type in GL create program. Now, again, this is lovely OpenGL being completely inconsistent. This function doesn't take in the reference to an integer or anything like that, or a pointer to an integer. It actually returns an unsigned integer. So what we're going to do is at the beginning, just write unsigned int program equals GL create program. Again, no clue why they've decided to be so inconsistent with their API, but hey, this is OpenGL. So the next thing we need to do is create our two shader objects. So vertex shader and fragment shader. And this is basically just kind of some OpenGL boilerplate code. Again, unsigned int, we'll call this one VS, which is going to just be equal to GL create shader. And this is going to be, at the, well, the type of the shader, which in this case is going to be GL vertex shader. Now, a lot of this code is actually going to be the same because basically we're just trying to compile two different types of shaders, but the process of giving OpenGL our source code and all that stuff is actually very, very similar between vertex and fragment shaders. So I'm actually going to just abstract this out into, a, into its own function so that I can call that function two times and not have a bunch of code duplication. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to go static unsigned int compile shader and it's going to be const std string source and 
I believe GL vertex shader is actually, it's just an integer. I don't think they really need to, let's just see what create shader takes in. GL enum, and I think if I search for GL enum here, just using visual assist, it's an unsigned int. So I'm just going to write unsigned int type. Now I don't really like using OpenGL's built-in kind of types for several reasons, but mainly just because I tend to use multiple graphics APIs. And if I start using OpenGL's types for everything, then I kind of need to include OpenGL everywhere and all that stuff. So if you're seeing me kind of use unsigned int in these cases, instead of GL, in, instead of kind of, what is it? Uh, GLU int. Oops, it's written like this, I think. Yeah, I don't like using types like this. I much prefer just using the raw C++ types, which they are anyway. That's just because I tend to deal with multiple APIs and that's what I'm used to. Just keep that in mind, you might've seen that before. It's definitely what I would recommend doing. Okay, so if we scroll back up here, um, compile shader, let's just move this code that we've got over here. Actually, I might just move this create shader over here and then just make, uh, let's see, unsigned int ID equals GL create shader. Okay, cool. And then we can kind of assign this to be compile shader. This will be the vertex shader and I'll specify that it is our GL vertex shader. I actually think I'm going to reorder these arguments because it probably makes more sense to actually specify the type first and then the actual source code. So let's just reorder these real quick. No big deal. There we go. All right, cool. So let's continue on with our compile shader function. One thing that OpenGL is actually going to want to expect is instead of us actually providing a C++ standard string, it's actually going to want a raw string. So I'm just going to write const char src for source and then just set this equal to source.c string which we can write like this. This just returns a pointer, as you can see, it actually says in a comment, return pointer to null terminated immutable array. So immutable definitely means that you shouldn't be changing this, but also this is just a pointer to the beginning of our data. We could have also written uh, code like this. You might've seen this kind of code uh, before. Basically, this is just looking up the very first character in the string and then returning a, 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 the memory address of it, which ends up returning this because the string API does provide us with C string. I prefer to write this code. One thing I want to point out, this is more of a C++ thing, but just in case you do something crazy, source needs to exist at this point, right? This string needs to exist. This doesn't copy the array or return to you a new kind of array. This returns a pointer to the data inside std string, meaning that if you have, if, if string has gone out of scope or something and you're still holding on to this actual char pointer, it's going to point to rubbish memory and this code isn't gonna work. So just make sure that your source string is actually still alive at the time of you kind of compiling this code. Sometimes I see people kind of, you know, get string dot C string or something like that. This kind of code is very dodgy. I might actually make a C++ episode on this specific kind of practice because it seems to kind of throw off a lot of people and I can see why it's easy to miss if you're new to C++. But basically if this just returns kind of a temporary string and you get the C string from it, then that string might have gotten cleaned up, might have gotten kind of, might have gone out of scope by the time we reach this line, which means that this this kind of pointer is pointing to memory that's been freed already, and you'll get errors and stuff like that. Which is why my recommendation is also to kind of, if you if you've got a function which which returns a string, to actually kind of create and create an actual L value out of it, and then deal with that. And again, probably 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 a comment for the C++ series, but just wanted to throw it in here. Why not? So back to our actual code, let's get back on track. We've got our source, we've got a pointer to the actual source character data. The next thing we're going to do is actually call GL shader source, which specifies the source of our shader. You can see the first thing we want is the shader, which is just basically the ID. The next thing we want is count. So how many source codes are we specifying? Just one. The next thing it wants is an actual, now you'll know that there are kind of two pointers here. It actually wants a pointer this is a double pointer. It basically just wants a pointer to the actual pointer. So we actually have to, we actually have to give it the memory address of that source variable and then the length. Now this is important. If you don't really want it to use the whole string or anything, you can specify it here. We're just gonna pass in null pointer. Again, I encourage you guys to actually go to docs.gl and check out all of these kind of functions and make sure that you actually understand kind of the code that you're writing. I am mentioning a lot about how these, how these kind of functions work in this series, just out of experience. But remember, knowing, for example, that you can pass null into length, like if length is null, each string is assumed to be null terminated, stuff like that really does help to read the docs. And I would be, and if I was actually trying to learn OpenGL properly, like I assume most of you guys are, 
keep this open as you go along with these videos and as you type this code, certainly, so that you know kind of what's going on. OpenGL tends to be very flaky in the sense that if you actually get a little minor detail wrong, you might just see a black screen and it might not work at all. Very, very soon, we're gonna have an episode about OpenGL errors and how to deal with them and my strategy for dealing with them. So that's coming up soon. We don't really, I, I haven't done it yet because we're just drawing something as trivial as a triangle and really that, that you wouldn't expect that to go wrong, would you? I mean, it, it will and it can, can and probably will for a lot of you go wrong. But very soon when we start to get into more kind of fun stuff, I am gonna make an episode about OpenGL errors. But that being said, keep the documentation open, read it. With an API as fragile as OpenGL that gives you so little help when things go wrong, you want to basically master the, do master the documentation if you want to actually be good at OpenGL. Okay, so going back here, we've specified the shader source code. The next thing we need to do is basically just say GL compile shader. And we need to specify which shader we want to compile, which in this case is just the shader ID. And that is actually all the code that we need to write to compile that actual shader so we can return the ID and everything is good. Now we're not doing any kind of error handling. So we definitely need to basically just syntax errors and stuff like this. We need to do some kind of error handling for this actual shader to see maybe we just accidentally, you know, missed a, missed a semicolon or something like that in our shader source code. We can handle all that in a minute. Okay, so going back to our create shader, we're going to duplicate this line of code, call it FS for our fragment shader, type in GL fragment shader and give it the fragment shader source code over here. Once we've done that, we basically need to attach both, both of these shaders to our program. So think of this almost like compiling C++ code. We've got two different files, and now we want to basically link them into kind of one program so that we can, well, use both of them. So we're going to type in gl attach shader. We're going to specify the program that we want to attach to, and then the actual shader. So we're going to do this two times, one for each shader vertex shader and fragment shader. Then we're going to link our program by calling GL link program, which we just take in the name of the program, or rather not, not the name, but the ID. And finally, we're going to type in GL validate program. And these functions, again, are something that you should read about in the documentation if you actually want to understand what they do. You can kind of see that basically what this does is, well, performs validation on the actual program. And the kind of status of the validation, again, will be stored as part of the program's object state, which you can actually call kind of GL get program and query what the actual result is and all that stuff. Again, I encourage you guys to read the documentation. I'm not going to explain these too much right now because it's kind of code you write once and forget about. So I don't really think it's important to talk about them too much, but definitely consult the documentation, especially if you have problems with your shader or you just want to understand more and be the ultimate open gel master. Finally, we can actually delete our shaders. Now that's because they've been linked into a program. So we can kind of delete the intermediates, if you will. In C++, when we compile something, we get intermediate.obj files, object files, when we're dealing with Microsoft's compiler. And at the end, we can kind of delete that because we've actually got an actual program now. They're stored inside the program. So we're actually gonna call gl delete shader with vs and fs. There are some other functions like gl detach shader and stuff like that, which will actually delete the source code. The reason I don't like to touch those functions, there's a few reasons. First of all, they're not really that necessary to even clean that up because it's it takes a, a trivial amount of memory anyway, but having the shader source code still around is very important when you kind of deal with things like graphics debugging, because if you kind of delete the shader from the GPU, the, the shader source code from the GPU, you can't verify and you can't kind of breakpoint and step through your shader like you can with certain NVIDIA tools, which we will get into. If you kind of detach your shaders and delete all the source code and stuff like that, you're gonna lose a lot, of that, a lot of that debugging ability. And to be honest, like a lot of game engines don't even bother calling gel detach shader because it's so such a minimal like gain that it's just, it's not worth it. And that's really all we have to do. We can finally return our program. Now you might've noticed that we're actually returning an int, whereas this program is an unsigned int. So I'm just gonna clean this up so that it actually returns an unsigned int and that is our shader. Let's quickly do this error handling because I have a feeling when I actually write the shader in a minute, in a minute here, it's just, it's just gonna be wrong and I'm just gonna make a mistake and then I'm gonna be like, great, nothing works. And I'm gonna to have to end up writing this error handling code anyway. So let's just write it now. Much like we just read about GL validate program setting like some kind of state and then we can retrieve it. We can also retrieve the result of this compilation. Compile shader doesn't actually return anything. However, we can query it to find out if anything's wrong. And the way we do that is by calling GL get shader IV. Now this is our first kind of introduction to I and V and all this, because Jill get shader is really the function. IV is basically the types that it needs. So first of all, we type in the ID, 
Then we type in the parameter name in the form of an actual GL enum, which we know is an unsigned integer. Basically, this is just going to be a constant here that's defined by OpenGL. In this case, we're getting the compile status and then the int parameter, which we know is just an int pointer. So I'm going to type in int result and then pass in the memory address of that result. I basically specifies that we are specifying an integer. V kind of specifies that it wants a vector, so an array kind of. In this case, it really just means it wants a pointer. Then we check to see if the result is equal to false. So if result equals GL false, now you might note that GL false, if I just hit Alt F12 here, GL false is just defined to zero. So you could, if you want, also kind of specify if result with an exclamation mark to say if result is false. And I usually do stuff like that. I don't like doing it here though, because we're specifically checking with GL false and not just kind of false or anything like that. Um, this kind of just makes a little bit more sense, I think to people watching as well. So I'll keep it as that. So if the result was false means our shader did not compile successfully. What we actually want to do now is get the, the error message. And the way we can do that is basically query the error message length first. So if I type in int length and then gl get shader iv id gl info log length, you can see why I just love OpenGL's API because really it's just it's just it's it's just great. And then we'll specify the memory address of length so that it can store that data there. Once we have that, we can actually construct just a stack allocated kind of char array here. So message I'll say with the parameter length. Now, now we get a little bit of a problem here. That I don't like either, <laughs> but you can see I can't just create a stack allocated length here uh, because length is actually a variable and not a constant. And for some reason, C++ just cannot grow the, stra the stack by an arbitrary size in some cases. We're not gonna, we're, 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 we're good though. We're above this kind of level of comedy. So we're actually going to uh, hack this. I still want this to be defined on the stack. I could use something, I could just, most people will probably solve this just by making this a heap allocation and then kind of deleting it later or maybe assigning it to a unique pointer or something like that. I am not most people. I don't like this. I still want this to just be a normal char allocated on the stack. So what I'm going to do is actually set this equal to alloc A and then the size being just length times size of char. Char being, of course, a lowercase char like that. Okay, and we're going to cast this result back to a char pointer and we're going to get a pointer to that like that. Allocate is a function that C actually gives you, which lets you allocate on the stack dynamically, like what we've done right now, okay? Use at your kind of discretion. Uh, a lot of people don't like using stuff like this. There's no reason for not using it. It's a nice function. I like using it in this case. It's totally necessary and let's continue. I might actually make a C++ episode about this specifically because it's not as, it's not as well known as it probably should be. Okay, the next thing we'll do is gl get shader info log shader being ID, the buffer size being length, then it wants an actual length in the form of a pointer for some reason. This is gonna be the output length, I guess, maybe. Again, should read the documentation. And then finally, it wants a pointer to that actual buffer. So we'll just type in message like that. Then we're going to actually print the message to the console. I'm just gonna use standard C out in this case. So C out message and end line. Before we actually do that, I might print a kind of fail to compile shader. Now we don't know which kind of shader it failed to compile at this point. So what we actually could do if we were if we were really cool is basically just check to see what type the shader was. In this case, we know we're only compiling either a vertex or a fragment shader. So what I could do is if I just kind of separate this code out like this, what I could do is write type equals gl vertex shader. If that's true, I'm going to actually move it down here so you can see what I'm typing. If that's true, we're going to write vertex. If it's false, we're going to write fragment. Again, this is a little bit hacky because we could have more than just these two shader types, but I think that's probably totally fine. I'm going to kind of bring this line back to being on one line, but I've actually got wrapping turned on so you can see a bit of it anyway. All right, cool. So we're printing a message saying that we failed to compile our type of shader and then we're printing the message. Finally, we should kind of handle this result by writing gl delete shader because of course our shader compilation didn't work out. And then we can return something like zero because we are returning an unsigned answer. We can't really return negative one. Okay, cool. There we go. Now we're not checking here to see if it works or anything like that. We should probably assert or something like that if this doesn't work out because it's kind of vital to our program running successfully. But anyway, we'll at least get the error message printing to the console. That should be enough to debug it in our situation here. All right, cool. So that's all that we need. Now we can actually write a shader quickly and hopefully use it. So let's talk about writing some shaders now. We're going to come down here to just after we create all these buffers. It doesn't really matter where we do this. I might just do this after the kind of vertex attribute pointer. 
So first of all, we know that we can just type in unsigned int shader equals create shader. And then we just need to specify two strings, which are the source code and that's it. So let's kind of just write our first shader, std string vertex shader equals. And now we're going to write our source code. Now this is a little bit annoying to write as a C++ string because we have to put like a new line character after every line and all that, super annoying, but we'll kind of do it anyway. So I'll kind of bring this down here to make it a little bit easier. First thing we're going to write is version 330 core, which basically just means that we're going to be using GLSL, which is OpenGL, which is the GL shading language, OpenGL shading language, ver version 330. And core means that it's not going to let us use any kind of deprecated functions or anything like that. That would result in a shader compilation because we just, we just want to make sure that we're using the latest and the greatest that we have. Now, the reason I'm not writing like 450 or 440 here is because we don't really need all those new features just yet. When we do, we will switch to using those more modern languages. And in this case, we're just ensuring a bit of extra compatibility. I want to write a new line character and then I'm going to just press enter in C++, you don't need to write like plus or anything like that. If you just write strings kind of like this, one after the other, they will be concatenated into a single string. Okay, next we'll have just a kind of a blank line just because, again, I'll make sure I kind of write new line here. We don't really need to write new line. This is more for me than actual C++, but we'll actually do it anyway. And then finally, void main. This is our main function for our shader. I'm just going to open it up like it was any other function. You can see I'm already kind of forgetting to write new lines everywhere, which is fun. Another reason why defining these kind of shaders and files is a lot better, and we will probably do that next episode. This main function works much the same way as our actual main function does in C++ when we actually have int main here. We're basically just specifying what function, th this, this main function will get called when this vertex shader gets called. And what we basically wanna do in here is just set gl position equal to our attribute, which is our vertex position, which we kind of specify over here. And we take in via vertex attribute pointer at index zero. So how do we access this data? How do we access these two floats in our actual shader? Well, we need to specify the actual attribute up here. So I'm going to kind of add some space here and then specify the attribute. And I'm going to do this by basically typing in in vec for position. And then at the beginning of the line, I'm just going to specify that this actual attribute is located at index zero. And the way I'm doing that is just by writing layout location equals zero like that. And then in vec for position. So this, this zero is, should be matching up with this zero. It is the index of our attribute. So one thing you might've noticed is that I'm taking in a vec four. However, I'm actually giving it a vec two. Why am I doing that? Well, first of all, this needs to be a vec4 eventually anyway, because GL position is actually a vec4 and we can't just assign a vec2 to a vec4. We could change this to be a vec2, but then we'd actually have to kind of convert it into a vec4 by taking in position dot xy and then kind of specifying whatever we want for the other values, which would probably be something like zero and one. We don't really want to do that. Instead, what we can do is actually get OpenGL to convert this into a vec4 anyway. Remember, it knows this is a vec2. It knows this is, this is a two component vector because we've wrote, we've written two here. That's why it knows to cast this. And because it's an actual position, it's going to set the fourth kind of component position.w to actually be uh, one, which, which is what it should be if our, if our vector is an actual positional vector. We might talk a little bit more about mathematics and OpenGL and how vectors work and all that in a future video, but just know that this is what we're writing for now. Okay, cool. That looks pretty good. That's actually all we need to do in our vertex shader. So let's just end that with a semicolon and let's write a fragment shader. I'm gonna copy all this, all this code here come down here, call this fragment shader. I don't need any of this kind of layout stuff, but what I do need to do remember is our fragment shader should be outputting a color. So I can just, I can keep layout location equals zero here if I like, it's not really necessary, it will be zero by default anyway, but I'm just changing this to be out, vec4, and then I'll just call this color. This version 330 stays the same, main function stays the same, but here we actually specify what color we would like to output. Let's try red. So I'm gonna write color equals vec4, 1.0, 0.0, 0.0, .0 and then the alpha value, which is, we'll, we'll set that to one. Okay, cool. So colors in graphics programming are traditionally just floats between zero and one in kind of a non HDR environment. So basically zero is black and one is white. So if you're used to colors being between zero and 255, think of zero as zero and 255 as one. So if I write 0 0.5, that will kind of be 50% red. And the way that these go is R, G, B, and A. Now this kind of RGBA layout and all that kind of depends on your actual frame buffers format, but for this kind of default setup, it definitely 
is just RGBA. So we should see our triangle as red now. That is all of the source code that we need to write. Hopefully I haven't made any errors. I don't think I have. Just checking to make sure I have new lines everywhere. I don't over here. That's not a big deal, but I'll add it anyway. Uh, and that looks pretty good to me. Cool. So over here on the create shader, let's specify our vertex shader and our fragment shader, and hopefully everything goes well. We can bind our shader by just writing GLU's program and then shader. And that's it. Our actual red shader should now be used to render this. I'm gonna hit F5 and hopefully we will see a red triangle. And we see a white triangle and no errors as well. Fantastic. Let's take a look at what I did wrong. Okay, so just scrolling up here and let's take a, oh, well, there you go. GL vertex shader, nice. I bet you guys had a good laugh when you saw me write that. Make sure this is obviously compiling the type so that we're not compiling two vertex shaders. I'm actually surprised that it worked. Well, actually, no, I guess this is a valid vertex shader because we do, we are outputting color as just kind of a vec4 AM. That's all good. That would have been a valid vertex shader. That's why we didn't get any errors. We should definitely verify if our error messaging is working correctly. Let's just hit F5 and see if this works though. All right, fantastic. You can see that we've got a red triangle and our shader seemed to work successfully. Awesome, let's quickly just close this. I'm going to make a deliberate syntax error in one of my shaders, maybe in the fragment shader, just gonna miss this semicolon here. Let's hit F5. Okay, so we don't get anything on the screen and you can see in our log it actually does say fail to compile fragment shader and specifies that on line nine we have an error because, well, it's, it just says syntax error, syntax error. Fantastic, thank you Intel, it's great compiler man. All right, cool, anyway. Let's go kind of back, let's revert back to our code. This is a very, very simple shader. We've just got a red triangle running. I'll just hit a five again so we can see that awesome triangle. Pretty cool stuff. One more thing I wanna quickly mention is that what you should do to clean up your shader once you're done with it, so maybe like over here, is actually called GL delete shader and then the shader you want to delete. Now we should also be doing this for kind of vertex buffers and all of that. We are going to abstract a lot of this stuff into classes. In fact, next time I'm gonna show you how to actually read shaders in from files and my strategy for reading them in and how I like to kind of write shaders because I don't like the way that OpenGL kind of makes you write them and all that. So we'll talk about that next episode. But as we begin to abstract this into files, we are going to cover actually cleaning up and all that stuff because that's going to get super important when we actually have a running program in which we kind of create and destroy things all the time and we don't want to be leaking GPU memory or anything like that. Now, we're not going to go too far with the abstraction, of course, because this isn't a game engine series, but we are still going to abstract it a little bit so that we don't just write our entire program in one file. It's going to get very difficult when we have a lot of code to actually achieve certain graphics like effects and strategies and all that. So that should be a lot of fun. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit the like button. If you want all the source code for this video, because we did write quite a lot, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the channel, help support the series, and you will get access to a private GitHub repository with all of the source code episode by episode. So you can just follow along to the episode you're currently on and all of that by just looking at the commit history. It's great. And again, you'll also be helping support the series, which is very important. There are also some other pretty cool rewards. For example, the top tier patrons. Actually, we have like a one hour hangout once a month where we just talk about pretty much anything. It's pretty cool stuff. Anyway, definitely check out patreon.com forward slash the channel. Really does help support the series. So thank you so much to everyone who's helping make this happen. As always, you can talk about this episode by just leaving a comment below or just going to the channel.com slash discord and joining that community. It's awesome. Next time we're going to do some more shader stuff. I'll see you then. Goodbye.